everyone, April here. Welcome back to my channel where we talk all things Microsoft 365 and the Power Platform. A lot of you all commented on my SharePoint intro video that I did a while back, thanking me for the video and requesting that I do the same thing for Dataverse. So today we're going to do a quick overview of what Microsoft Dataverse is and how it works. All that coming up right after this. So what is Microsoft Dataverse? Well, it's a cloud-based, low-code data service and application platform. This was formerly referred to as the Common Data Service or CDS. So if in some of my old videos or any other of the Power Platform YouTubers old videos, you hear them mention CDS or Common Data Service, that is the same thing as Dataverse. It's just given a new name and rebranded. And Dataverse gives us a way to structure a variety of data and business logic to support interconnected applications and processes. Dataverse is managed and maintained by Microsoft. So this is a data service that you don't have to worry about the maintenance of. Dataverse is available globally and can be deployed geographically as well to comply with any potential data residency requirements. And an important distinction here with Dataverse to make here is it's not like Access. This is not something that is designed to be used standalone on a server. You need to have an internet connection to access Dataverse. So what is Dataverse designed to do? Well, it's meant to be the central repository for our business data. Dataverse is actually what powers a lot of the Dynamics 365 solutions like field service, customer service, and all of that. And of course, if you've watched my channel at all or any of the other Power Platform channels, then you know that Dataverse is also what powers the entire Power Platform, like Power Apps, Power Automates, BI, and Power Virtual Agents. So if you're using the Power Platform right now, you're actually already using Dataverse in some capacity. Dataverse is also utilized by AI Builder and Power Apps portals as well. So now that we understand a very high level of what Dataverse is and what it's designed to do and where we would actually use it with the Power Platform and Dynamics and all of that, let's take a step back and see everything that Dataverse can do because it is more than just a database. I probably have been guilty of this as well when we're talking about you know, building Power Apps, for example, and what data sources we can use. You know, we throw in SharePoint and Excel and SQL and Dataverse. And sometimes it makes it appear that Dataverse is just a database, but it's really important to point out that it's much more than a database. It's an application platform. So this visual will really kind of highlight everything that it can do. And it's important to highlight that Dataverse is API first. Everything that we're doing in Dataverse is actually creating an API. And these are the same APIs that we consume in our Power Platform services, but also additionally, we can consume in our custom applications that we create in Visual Studio, for example. Immediately below this, we have a security layer side of Dataverse. Dataverse actually handles its authentication with Azure Active Directory. This allows us to bring conditional access and multi-factor authentication to Dataverse to secure it. So we're able to ensure that the right people see the data and that we can audit that access along the way. And the cool thing is this security not only applies to the Dataverse level itself, but also the individual columns and rows of our data, which we'll explain more what that means here in a second. Beyond the security layer, we have the logic layer. We're actually able to apply business logic at the data layer. What that means is regardless of how a user is interacting with the data, the same rules can apply. So this can be things like workflows, duplicate detection, and business rules, which we'll talk a little bit about later on. Now we're getting into the heart of Dataverse, which is the data layer. Now, although it's more than just a database, data is a big part of what we can do with Dataverse. So it gives us a way to structure our complex business data without having to write code because it is a low code platform. So within the data layer here in Dataverse, we can discover, model, validate, and report off of our data. Next, we have the storage layer. Dataverse is a relational database. And all of our physical data in Dataverse is stored in the Azure cloud. So that means we don't have to worry about where our data lives and we're ensured that it's scalable. And it can handle all kinds of data from relational data, but it also supports file and blob storage, log files, data lake, and semi-structured data. And lastly, we have the integration layer. More commonly than not, we're wanting to integrate with other systems when we're using a database like this or a data platform. So of course, Dataverse offers a rich integration layer where we can seamlessly interact with other systems. We can do this through things like Event Hub, Service Buses, Webhooks, Exporting to Excel, SQL, and Data Lake. 
Now that we understand everything that's going on behind the scenes, now let's go into the details of the data layer. In the data layer, we have these things called databases. And that's just an instance of Dataverse storage. You've probably heard the term database before if you've used other databases, say like SQL Server or even Access. These databases give us a way to store data and how we do that is with something called tables. That's how we structure our data inside of a database. Now table, all that is, is a logical set of rows that we use to store data. So again, think Access, SQL Server, or even Excel. In those tables, we have rows, and those rows contain many different columns to manage pieces of information that we might store about an item in the row. And we can have multiple of these databases inside of Dataverse. When we're talking about tables where we actually store our data, there are two main types of tables that we need to be aware about for Dataverse. The first is standard tables. These are our base set of tables that are created whenever we create a new database inside of Dataverse. These are tables that Dataverse relies on to do its thing. So we can't delete these tables and we can't delete the standard columns that are included in these tables, but we are able to utilize them and add additional columns to customize them a bit that way. We also have something called complex tables. These tables traditionally contain business logic like workflows, plugins and things like that. So if we need to create any custom tables, then we can create those with the complex table type. Now in those tables, we mentioned we have columns and that's how we actually store pieces of information. So because so many of us use Excel, I like to keep paralleling to how Excel works. In Excel, we have a workbook. We can have tables in Excel and we can define the columns in there and store data within rows in Excel. So very similar concept here with Dataverse. In Dataverse though, we do have to define what type of data are we storing in a given column. So when we create columns inside of a Dataverse table, we have to choose what type of data that is in the column. Is it going to be, for example, date time? Is it going to be number, single line of text, choice? So we have to define what type of data is going to be stored in that when setting up these columns. And we can't talk about tables and columns and databases and all that without talking about relationships. And when I intro Dataverse in the beginning, I mentioned that it was a relational database. So what do we mean by that? Well, to best explain this, let's talk through a scenario. Say we want to create a system to manage sales orders. Well, to do that, we're going to need to track a few pieces of information. First, we're obviously going to need somewhere to store information about the products that we're selling. Then we probably need to have some kind of way to store information about who we're selling those products to, who are our customers. Then when we give customers a way to order products, we're going to need to be able to generate and store information about invoices. And those invoices should contain information about line items of what products that customer is ordering. Now this is a fairly complex system. Now, while we could store all of this information technically inside of a single table in a database in Dataverse, that's probably not the most efficient way. It's gonna get a little bit messy. This would be best done by utilizing relationships. And to do that, what we can do is we can make each one of these a separate table inside of a Dataverse database. We can have a customer's table, a products, and invoices, and align items. And we can define a relationship between a customer and an invoice, and an invoice and a line item, and a line item with a product. When we're talking about relationships, there are a few main type of relationships that we can create in Dataverse that we need to be aware of. The first is one to many. What this means is table A can be associated with more than one row in table B, but each row in table B can only match one row in table A. Now a more real life example of this would be a class for students would have a single classroom. Then we have many to one, obviously the opposite of one to many. So each row in table B can match more than one row in table A, but each row in table A can only match one row in table B. The real life example of this would be one single teacher teaches many classes. And finally, we have many to many. Each row in table A can match more than one row in table B and vice versa. The real life example of this is students can attend many classes and each class can have many students. So now we should have a good understanding of how data is physically stored inside of the databases in tables with columns and relationships. Now let's take a step back and talk about something called environments. Because when we're using Dataverse, we're commonly using that to build Power Platform solutions with. 
And to be able to do that, we have to use something called environments because that's what gives us a way to store and manage the business solutions that we create in the Power Platform. These environments are created under an Azure Active Directory tenant, which means they can only be accessed by users within the tenant. Now, similar to what we talked about earlier with Dataverse, these environments as well are bound to a particular geographic location. So when you go and set up the environment, you choose what location it should be tied to, like the United States or Europe or Canada. And when you do that, that gets passed down to the databases that you create with Dataverse inside of that environment. So if I define my environment to be in the United States region, that means that database that is created and associated with it will be created in data centers tied to that region. We can create multiple environments in our tenant for the Power Platform. So kind of like you're seeing here, we can have an environment for USA, we can have one for Canada, and we can have one for Australia. But within these individual environments, we can only have one Dataverse database per environment. Now, earlier I mentioned the logic layer of Dataverse and how we can apply something called business rules. Let's dive into what business rules are exactly. These business rules give us a way to apply business logic at the data layer instead of the application layer, which really means if we create a business rule in Dataverse, it's in effect regardless of where we're actually interacting with the data. And these business rules are used to do things like setting default values, validating data, showing error messages, and showing or hiding column. Those are some really common use cases of business rules and we can use those in our Canvas and our model-driven applications. And again, the benefit being we can do what we're seeing here. We can have a business rule that says, for example, check if the field credit limit is over $1,000. And if so, whether we're using this in a Canvas app or a model-driven app, I want to set this field called business required to VP approval so that we get that approval for that if it's over that amount. And lastly, let's talk about how do we actually administer and set up Dataverse to use? Well, we do that with the Power Platform Admin Center, which we can get to by going to admin.powerplatform.com. This is kind of our one-stop shop and where we're going to go to manage and administer this and do things like creating those environments and creating the databases within the environments. We can also do things in here like setting up data policies for data loss prevention and security, which I cover in some of my other videos on the channel, setting up data integrations and monitoring our licenses and our quotas for our databases. So here we are in the Power Platform Admin Center and you see the default tab is our environments tab and we can see all of the different environments that we currently have inside of my tenant here. When we're using the Power Platform, everyone gets a default environment. So that's what we're seeing here. This is the name of my tenant in quotes with default there. We can't delete this default environment, but we can customize it and rename it if we like. But everyone gets that and this environment does have a Dataverse database associated with it. We also have several different other environments. So we can create a new environment by clicking on the new tab here. And this is where the region settings are applied. So we can see I can choose my default region or any of these other regions. And when I choose this setting, this gets passed down to Dataverse to the database so that the database there is provisioned in the appropriate data center in that region. I can go to the Power Apps site at make.powerapps.com and this is where we can actually see the tables inside of our Dataverse databases. Now, these are tied to environments, so I do have to keep in mind what environment I'm actually in when I am inside of the Power Apps site here. So if I wanna see uh, databases and tables that I've created in my April Dunham environment, I wanna make sure that I'm in that here and switched over. But then on the left-hand side, we can expand out this data tab. And here you'll see tables. So we have the one database that's associated with this April Dunham environment. And we can see that I have multiple tables associated with this database. And you'll see two types here. We have standard and custom. Now again, standard being those are the ones that come out of the box anytime that you create a new Dataverse database. Those are the ones that we can't delete, but we can add columns to. And then we have custom. Those are all the additional tables that we have came in here and selected new table, and we've went through and added our own custom tables. Now to do that, we just give our table a name here um, and a display name and a primary column, and that will go through and set up a brand new table for us. And you can see I've set up quite a few different tables. One, for example, is called events. So I can click on that. And when we select the table, we can see all the columns that we have with the table. 
And one thing to point out here as well, when you create a brand new table from scratch, you'll see quite a few columns be created by default. So we have some standard columns that again, we can't and don't want to delete that come included with our tables that we create to do things like track who created the table, who last modified it, who the original author is, um, some status and things like that. We can add columns by clicking the add a column and in the data type section, that's where we would choose the type of data that we would be storing in this column. And you can see that it supports many different data types from text. We even have types for email to enforce that someone enters in a valid email address or phone number, stock ticker symbols. And down here you see how we can support files and images even with our column types. So lots of different options that we have here and different types of data that we can support. Again, making this a really compelling choice as opposed to something like Excel or SharePoint, which isn't quite as robust in the type of fields that it supports. And if we look across here, here are the other things that we can configure. We talked about relationships earlier. We have this special relationships tab where we can associate and define any relationship. So in my case, I have a table called events and I have another table called sessions. So one event might contain multiple sessions. So I can actually go in here and see add a relationship and there are those different relationship types that I just explained earlier. So I could say for this, it could be a one to many. So I'm in the events table. So one event could be associated to many and I can choose in my drop down here the table that I want to create the relationship with. So if I scroll down here, I should have a table called session. So I can select that. And then below, what this is going to do is actually create a column to create the associated lookup too. So it's going to create a new lookup column called events so that I can tie a session to a particular event. And then all I have to do is click done and save table. And this will actually go apply and create that lookup for me. We also have a special tab as you're seeing here for business rules. So this is where we could go and configure any of those business rules that we have here. And then just looking across all the other tabs here, we have these things called views. It's really similar to SharePoint and how we have the concept of views there and how we can filter what columns show in a particular view. So we have all these default views that are created for us when we initially create the table and we have the ability to go into any one of these views and it will take us to a screen that looks like this where we can configure what columns we wanna show in this view. So on the left-hand side here, we'll show all of our different columns. I could just drag and drop and place into the screen on the right, the column that I wanna show and build out my view this way. So I'll drag in some details here and then when you're done, we'll just click save and publish and now we've just built out our view. And of course we can do things as well, like changing what we sort and filter the view by down below here on the right hand side. We also have a forms tab. So when we create these tables in Dataverse, we have an input form that is created for us to be able to add new information into our table. So those forms are stored here on the forms tab. And if we want to override one, we can go into the form. It'll take us again to an edit experience where we can choose what fields we want to show in their particular form. So this is going to go and load here. And it's going to show what I have right now on this form. And so far, I'm only displaying the name. We can click the table columns button in the left hand pane, and that's going to show all of the table columns similar to what we saw in our view edit screen. And we can just drag and drop the different fields that we want to be able to input into this form. And once I have all that over here, we can click save and publish and that will update our corresponding forms. In the data tab, if we go over to that, this is where we can actually see what data has been submitted inside of our database in Dataverse. So if I were to go right now and add a new record, for example, it's going to take me to a brand new input form. I can see all those fields we just added. So let's create a new event for the Powerful Devs Conference. Let's see, we'll put a big number in here and save and close. And now you'll see there in our data tab, we have that information surfaced up here. All right, that's all that I have for you today. If you found this video helpful, please do me a favor and support my channel by giving it a big thumbs up and hitting that subscribe button. Thanks, and I'll catch you in the next video.